In the last video, we talked about Venn diagrams and set operations involving two sets. So in this section, we're going to do essentially the same thing, but we're going to look at the operations and the diagrams from the standpoint of three sets. So all the same set operations are defined for as many sets as we want. So just to review the operations we talked about, we talked about the complement. So you can think of the complement kind of as set subtraction. If you were to take what we call the universal set, which we can think of as the big set that we're then grouping into smaller subsets, we take the universal set, we remove all the elements in a particular subset, and what remains is what we call the complement of that subset. We can also take the intersection between two sets. So when we look at the intersection of two sets, we're looking for whatever elements they have in common. If they have anything in common, then, that, then the intersection will contain those particular elements. If we're comparing two sets that don't actually have anything in common, then the intersection is going to be the empty set. And then we can also talk about the union of two sets. So we can think of the union kind of like set addition. If we're taking the union of two sets, we're joining those two sets together, creating a bigger set that has all of the constituent elements from the individual two sets. So we're gonna look at some problems where we would use a combination of these operations, but specifically apply to three sets rather than two. So let's look at our sets first. So we have the universal set which is all of the natural numbers from 1 to 9. And then we have the set A, which is the natural numbers from 1 to 5. We have B, which is 2, 3, 6, 7. And C, which is 3, 4, 7, 8, and 9. So notice and verify that all three of these sets, A, B, and C, would all be considered subsets of the universal set. All of the elements in A, in B, and C can be found in the universal set. That is what the universal set is. We can think of it again as the context for our problem. So every set that we then define from there is gonna be a subset of the universal set. Okay, so let's look at one. So A, union, B, intersected with C. So we have two operations here. We have a union, we have an intersection. Now normally we just work left to right one operation at a time. In this case, we have a set of parentheses. So the parentheses tell us we need to do that particular operation first. So the first thing we're gonna do here is take the intersection of the sets B and C, okay? So I'm gonna go to B and C. What I'm looking for is what B and C have in common. So two, we can't match two to anything. Three matches, so three is an element that they have in common. And then also seven is an element that they have in common. So B intersected with C is gonna be the set containing three and seven. So we're now taking that set and we're taking its union with the set A, which has the elements one, two, three, four, and five. So remember the union just means we're joining these two sets together. We're creating a larger set that has all of those constituent elements. So the union is gonna have all the elements contained in A, one, two, three, four, five. And then from the other set, we add on a seven. So notice if we literally took the union and literally combined these two sets together, we would technically have two threes. As we've discussed before, the standard is that we don't write duplicates whenever possible. So if there is a duplicated element, one we see in both of the sets, we're only gonna write it the one time. Okay, let's look at another one. A union B intersected with A union C. Now here we have two sets of parentheses. So you can think of doing one union in one step, one union in a second step, and then doing the intersection at the end. Or if you're comfortable doing this, you could take both of the unions at the same time. You're technically doing one at a time, but you can write both of the results in one line if that seems easy enough to you. So A union B means we're taking A and we're taking B and we're joining them together. So from A, we're gonna get the elements one, two, three, four, and five. And then from B, we're gonna add on the elements six and seven. So A union B is gonna be the elements from one to seven. Now A union C, again, we're gonna take A, and we're gonna join it with C. So from A, we get one, two, three, four, five. And then from C, we're gonna add on seven, eight, and nine. And notice we're gonna skip six, so that's not gonna be contained in this set. So one, two, three, four, five, and then seven, eight, nine. So those are essentially replacing the two sets of parentheses. Those are the results of our two unions. Now we're taking the intersection 
of those two results. So we're asking the question, what do those two sets have in common? Well, we have the one, two, three, four, and five in common. Those were the elements that we got from the set A. Six is not gonna be a common element. We can't find six in both of the sets. However, seven is a common element. So the intersection is going to be one, two, three, four, five, and then seven. Okay, next one. A intersected with B union C complement. Okay, now again, we have to start inside parentheses, but here we actually have two operations inside parentheses. We have a union and we have a complement. So the general rule, if we have to decide which one of these to do first, is we always apply an operation that applies to a single set before we apply an operation that requires us to combine two sets together. So that means that our complement is gonna be what we do first. So I'm not gonna be able to do anything with A or with B yet until I take this complement. So I'm gonna write in A and B so that we have the whole problem written out. We have all our sets for reference. So we're gonna do C complement first. Now again, C complement means take the universal set, take the bigger set, the context for this whole problem, and then remove all of the elements specific to C. In other words, subtract out C if you wanna think of it that way. So C contains the elements three, four, seven, eight, nine. So we're going to remove those elements from the universal set. That would leave us with one and two, then we delete three and four, then we keep five and six, and then we delete seven, eight, and nine. So one, two, five, six. That is going to be our complement. And again, A and B, we haven't done anything with those yet, so I just copied those down so that we can see everything in one line. So now we have the complement done. Now we need to simplify everything in parentheses, which means we need to do our union second. So we're combining these two sets together. So we have one, two, three, five, six, seven. One, two, three, five, six, seven. Now we are taking the intersection between A and the result that we got from taking the complement and then taking the union. So we're looking for the common elements between these two sets. So we have one, two, and three in common. Four is not a common element, but five is. So our intersection is going to be one, two, three, five. Okay, let's look at another one. C complement intersected with A union B complement. Okay, so again, we've got a couple of layers here and we can think about doing things in a particular order in the sense that we do one operation at a time. There's also some options here to maybe do more than one thing at a time as long as we aren't violating any of the rules combining anything too quickly. So normally I would start inside parentheses. I do need to do that. Similarly to the one above, we have two operations in parentheses. We have a union and we have a complement. So we need to do the complement first before we can join those two sets together. So we'll take B complement and we won't be able to do anything with A yet. Now C complement is outside of the parentheses. And normally we would just start by doing whatever is in parentheses and then worrying about what's outside. But I want you to keep in mind, if we went ahead and simplified C complement, it's not gonna violate any of the rules. C complement just has to be simplified. We're taking the complement of an individual set and then we're gonna take its intersection with the results from what we get in parentheses. So I can actually go ahead and apply the complement operation to C while I'm applying the complement complement operation to B, and that's not actually going to violate anything in terms of the order that I have to apply these operations in. So I'm actually going to do both of those operations in one step. So let's, let's work left to right. So C complement, I think we actually found that one already, but let's look at it again. So we're taking the set C, we're removing its elements from the universal set. So that's going to leave us with one, two, five, and six. So that is going to be the result for C complement. Now we're taking the intersection of that set with the result from what we'll get in parentheses. Now we know there's two steps in parentheses. We can only do the complement in this first step. So A, we can't do anything with A right now. So I'm just going to copy it down and we'll 
use it in just a minute. So we need to take the complement of B before we can apply the union. So B contains the elements two, three, six, and seven. So its complement is gonna be everything in the universal set, except for two, three, six, and seven. So remove those elements. That's gonna leave you with one, four, five, eight, and nine. So that's gonna be B complement. So we did C complement, we did B complement. Now we have our intersection and we have our union. Now here we do have to adhere to the rules associated with parentheses. Now one thing I do wanna point out here that's tempting that I just wanna advise you not to do. If you see something like this, you see something happening in parentheses, you see something happening outside. Your intuition may say, this looks something like the distributive property from algebra. When I have a number outside parentheses, and I have addition or subtraction on the inside, I can distribute the multiplication on the outside to whatever's added or subtracted on the inside. This is not multiplication and addition or subtraction. These are completely different operations. There is no distributive property when it comes to set operations. So you can't skip a set and somehow distribute, or excuse me, skip a step and somehow distribute this set into parentheses. It doesn't work that way. You have to start inside the parentheses, simplify inside the parentheses, and then you work your way outward. So anytime you think, okay, there's parentheses, there's more than one thing in parentheses, I'm gonna distribute the operation or the other set into parentheses. No, there is never a rule that allows you to do something like that. You always work inside the parentheses and inside the parentheses exclusively. Okay, so that being said, we have our complements. Now we need to take our union. So one, two, three, four, five, that's gonna be in the union. And then from the other set, we're gonna add eight and nine. So one, two, three, four, five, eight and nine. We're now taking the intersection of that set with what we got from taking the complement of C, which was one, two, five, six. So we're looking for the common elements between these two sets. So one and two are common elements. Five is a common element. And then it doesn't look like six matches. So that means our intersection is going to be one, two, and five. Okay, let's look at a couple more. And I'm gonna have to flip back so we can look at the sets as needed um, in order to get the correct values. So this one's got a couple different layers. We're gonna have to be really careful here. So we have C complement intersected with A, union, C complement intersected with B complement. So let's count it. There's one, two, three, four, five, six operations involved here. We have three complements, two intersections, and one union. There is a very specific order that all of these operations have to be simplified in. We have two sets of parentheses, so we know that everything within those parentheses has to be simplified before we can do anything outside parentheses. What that tells us is that the union will be the last operation we apply. We won't be able to apply that until everything in the first set of parentheses and everything in the second set of parentheses is fully simplified. So the union will be the very last operation. Now we can do things inside each set of parentheses at the same time. As long as you can stay organized enough, you can work on both at the same time so that you don't have to rewrite so many things. So within each of those sets of parentheses, we have a few complementary operations. We're taking the complement of a few sets. We know we have to take the complement before we can combine any sets together. So C complement has to be applied before the intersection with A, and then C complement and B complement also have to be determined before we can take that intersection. So I can actually apply all three of those complement operations in one step. Again, as long as you're organized, you can do that in one step so that you don't have to rewrite so many things. So let's start with C complement. So let me flip back over, okay? Here's our C, complement says, take the universal set, remove the elements from C. So that's gonna leave us with one, two, five, and six. It's going to be our C complement. So we're intersecting C complement with A. 
A, we can't do anything yet, so we're just gonna copy that down, and A was one, two, three, four, five. Now we're gonna take the result of that, and we're going to unite it with C complement intersected with B complement. So notice C complement, we can just copy down what we got from the previous complement, and then we're intersecting that with B complement. So what's that gonna be? Flip back over. Here's B, two, three, six, seven. So take the universal set, remove the elements for B. So we're removing two, three, six, and seven, which leaves us one, four, five, eight, and nine. And that's going to be our B complement. Now, once we have all of that taken care of, we have everything we need from the previous page. Now we have all our sets written down and we're not gonna need anything else in terms of the actual listings for the sets. So we still need to simplify everything within the sets of parentheses. So each set of parentheses contains an intersection. We need to take those individual intersections. So for the first set of parentheses, I have common elements of one, two, five, and then it looks like that's it. So the first set of parentheses, when I take that intersection, I'm gonna get one, two, and five. Now the second set, when I take that intersection, one is a common element, five is a common element, and it looks like those are the only two things that these two sets have in common. So that intersection is one and five. Now, as I said at the beginning, notice the union is gonna be the last operation we apply because that's the only operation that's outside of the parentheses. So I'm uniting these two sets together, combining them into one. So from the first set, we get one, two, and five. And then as it turns out, we don't get any new elements from the second set. So the union here doesn't actually look larger than the two original sets we started with. In this case, the union is only gonna contain one, two, and five. Okay, next one. A union B complement intersected with C. Now normally, pretty much every one we've seen so far, we had to do the complement first. I want you to think about why you couldn't do the complement first here. Think about where it is in the problem. It's outside of a set of parentheses. Parentheses take precedence over anything else, regardless of what else is going on outside. Anything inside parentheses has to be simplified first. Now this is another spot where it would be tempting to try to do something that is not legal. That whole thing about distributing, well, you might look at this and think, well, if I'm taking A and B, uniting them and taking the complement, why don't I just take the complement of each of these and then unite that? It's not the same thing. You have to do the union first and then you take the complement. So let's look at A and B. We're taking A and B and we're taking their union. We're putting them together. So from A, we get one, two, three, four, five. And then from B, we're gonna add on the elements six and seven. And I think we also needed a C. So C is gonna be three, four, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so there's our union. There's C. Now the union, we're not quite done with that. We're also taking the complement of the set that results. So we're taking that set, taking its complement, which means we're taking the elements from that set, the set we got from the union, and removing those elements from our universal set. So if you remember, the universal set had all of the natural numbers from one to nine. So I'm gonna take that set, I'm gonna remove all of the numbers that I have here. So if I were to pull out all of these elements from my universal set, that's gonna leave me with just eight and nine. Now C, we haven't done anything that with that yet, so it's just copy and paste essentially. So now we're taking the intersection of this set that resulted with the set C. So in this case, eight is a common element and then nine is a common element as well. Three, four, seven are not common elements. So our final answer is going to be eight and nine. Okay, let's look at one final example. A union B union C complement. Now here we have two things going on in parentheses. We have two unions inside parentheses. Now we know we need to simplify inside of parentheses before we do anything on the outside. The only thing on the outside here is the complement. 
So that means the complement will be the last operation we apply. Now, because there's two things in parentheses and one doesn't necessarily take precedence over the other, we actually just work this one left to right. And you can approach this a couple different ways. You can think of it as just A union B, do that as one union, get a set from that, and then unite that set with C. So that is one option. Or because we have all the sets listed together and we can probably look at them all at one time, we can actually take the union of all three at one time. If you think about what that means, it's essentially like adding A and B and C all together. It's like adding three things together instead of just adding two things together. But you can probably do that in one step more than likely. So let's flip back over and let's look at those sets. So we're taking A, B, and C and we're taking the union of those three sets. We're joining all three sets together. So from A, we get the elements from one to five. Now B is going to add on six and seven, and then C is also going to add on eight and nine. So we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that is going to be the result of taking the union of all three of our subsets. Now we're not quite done. We still have to take the complement of that result. Well, remember the complement means take the universal set and remove all of those elements. Let's look at what we have in the universal set. The universal set has all of the elements, the natural numbers from one to nine. Well, our set also has all of the elements from one to nine. So the complement operation says, take the universal set, whatever it is, and remove all of these elements and just write the set containing whatever's left over. Well, this particular set actually contains all the elements that are in the universal set. Essentially what we have written here is the universal set. So if we were to take the complement of this set, write what's left over in the universal set, well, every single element has been removed from the universal set because every single element is represented here. That means we now have a set that doesn't actually have any elements listed. We don't have anything left over from the universal set. So what that means is that the resulting set is going to be the empty set. The answer from a set operation or a sequence of set operations is always gonna be another set. But in this case, this set doesn't have any elements and we have a name for that, we call that the empty set. So you could use the O with a slash, or if you remember, we had another notation for the empty set. You could also just write a pair of curly braces that don't have anything in them. Just make sure you don't use both. You use one notation or the other, but at that point, it's gonna be your choice. So notice that doing the set operations with three sets is really not that much different from doing it with two sets. We just have to be really careful about the order we do things in. We have to make sure we don't try to do too many things at one time. You don't wanna to try to maybe take a complement and then immediately combine it with another set. That's not a good idea. You could take a few complements, individual complements in one step. That's, that's especially fine. That's perfectly fine to do. But otherwise, be careful. Get in the habit of writing things down as you go. Don't try to do too much in your head. All sort of good things to do. The same kind of things that you would do if you work out a problem algebraically. You want to use those same kind of techniques here. So let's look at what these sets would look like in a Venn diagram. So we looked at Venn diagrams with one set. We looked at Venn diagrams with two sets. We know now that we can have a lot, of, we can have a variety of diagrams, a lot of different styles, just depending on how our subsets are related to one another. If they don't have anything in common, the diagram looks one way. If they have some things in common, the diagram looks another way. If everything is in common, the diagram is different. There are a lot of different variations for what a Venn diagram can look like. Now this particular diagram is what we would get if we wanted to talk about the relationship among three sets. Now keep in mind, we can do a diagram for as many sets as we want, but if you go beyond three sets, what we have represented here, the diagram gets significantly more complicated to draw. So we're gonna restrict ourselves to three sets exclusively. That's gonna be the highest we go. Now I want you to notice and think about when we looked at just Venn diagrams with two sets. 
The most common one we see is where we have our two circles and the two circles have some overlap, but they also have some areas that don't overlap. When that was the case, our Venn diagram was divided into four distinct regions. We had the overlapping region. We had the regions where elements would belong to each of the individual sets exclusively. And then we also had the region outside of the circles for things that are in the universal set, but weren't grouped into either of the subsets. So we had four separate regions. If we have three circles, that's going to give us a total of eight regions. And now intersection can look a couple different ways. At the very center of the diagram, we have complete intersection. We have intersection among all three of our sets. That's the one spot where all three sets overlap. Now we also have three other regions involving intersection, but in those particular regions, it's not all three circles overlapping, it's where only two circles overlap. We have regions that would contain elements that are exclusive to one of the subsets, and then just like with the two circle diagram, we also have the region containing elements in the universal set that weren't further grouped into one of these subsets, A, B, or C. So let's describe what's in each of these regions just based on how they're labeled. So we have our Venn diagram, again, with our um, Roman numerals. So these Roman numerals I've labeled top to bottom and left to right. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, then seven and eight. So here's what you do with these numbers because these look a little bit strange. V is going to be five. If you put a one before that, it means subtract that number from five. So this is five. A one before a five means subtract one from five, which would give you a four. If you put a one after the five, that means add on one, which would give you six. Here we have two after five, which means add on two, which gives you seven. Here we have three, which means add on three, and that gives you eight. Okay, so let's start, go region by region. Region one, what could we say about elements that are in region one? Well, they're in the circle for A, but they're in a portion of the circle that doesn't actually overlap with any of the other circles. So anything contained in region one is gonna be an element that's contained in A, but not contained in B or C. Now the region two is an intersecting region. So two represents A and B, notice it's where those two overlap, but that particular region does not contain anything from the circle C. So the region two contains elements from A and B together, but it doesn't contain anything that's also an element in C. So A and B, not C. Region three is in the circle for B and only the circle for B. So that's gonna be elements in B, but not in A or C. Now the region four, also intersection, so that's gonna be the circle for A and the circle for C, but it doesn't overlap with the circle for B. So that's gonna be elements in A and in C, but not in B. Now region five, that is the innermost intersection. That's where A, B, and C, all three of them overlap. So that's gonna contain elements that are in all three sets, which means there isn't anything that they're not contained in. They're in A, B, and C, which means they're also contained as part of the universal set. So they're essentially the things that are common to all of the sets that we're considering. Now region six, again, that's an intersection. So we have B, we have C, but we're not overlapping with the circle for A. That's gonna be elements in B and C, but not in A. Region seven, that's gonna be elements that are exclusive to C, so not in A or B. Now, don't forget, it's easy to forget once you've looked at all the regions in the circles, it's easy to forget the bigger region, the one that's left over, the one that's outside that, because remember, we always draw this rectangle or this square to represent the universal set, to represent the context of the problem. There are potentially still elements in the universal set that somehow didn't make it into any of these subsets, A, B, and C. So anything that's outside the circles, but still in the diagram, 
also has to be considered. So anything that makes it into this particular region is something in the universal set. We can't say that it's in A, B, or C because it's not, but it is in the universal set. It's under consideration in the context of the problem. So those are gonna be elements in the universal set, but they didn't make it into A, B, or C. Now, the next thing I wanna look at is how we'd apply some set operations based on a three circle diagram. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. This is a very visual kind of thing, but it also can be a very hands-on kind of thing. So I want to encourage you, use your fingers to cover things up as needed. Remember what a complement means more than anything. The complement means we're deleting something from the diagram. If we're taking the complement of A, it means we're removing A entirely from the diagram. So the way you can simulate that is by covering up whatever you want to remove. So don't feel bad using your hands. Use your fingers, get hands on, put your fingers onto the paper and try to visualize what each of these combinations of operations represents. Okay, we're not gonna worry about the associated regions portion. We just wanna make a list of the elements that are going to be in each of these sets. So we'll start big. First thing we wanna look at is the universal set. Now be careful when you see this. U does not mean just the things that are in the square outside of the circles. Keep in mind that the circles are also contained within this square, within this rectangle. So everything that's in a circle is also part of the universal set. So when we're defining the set U, we're talking about all the elements, anything that can be found anywhere in the diagram. Now again, you wanna be careful about the notation, the Roman numerals, those are all gonna be labels. Those are not set elements. The only set elements are the Arabic numerals. If you weren't aware, our number system is the Arabic number system. So 11, three, 12, so on and so forth. It looks like if you follow from smallest to largest, it looks like maybe we go from one to 12. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, sure enough. So our universal set is gonna be all of the natural numbers from one to 12, okay? Now what about the set A? What does this mean? This means anything anywhere in the circle for A. We're not worried about where it overlaps or where it doesn't overlap. We're just looking at elements that are specific to A that are somewhere in the set A. Now we can list them smallest to largest. You can just go region by region, your choice. Smallest to largest is not a bad idea though. So we're looking at all the sets that are anywhere within the circle for A. So the smallest one is gonna be three, then we have five, six, seven, and then 11 and 12. So three, five, six, seven, 11, 12. That's gonna be our set A. Now let's look at some actual operations, combining more than what's set together. What does this look like for a diagram? So A union B. Now we're only combining two together, but we wanna combine A and B together. Remember the union means take one set, take another set, combine them together as one unit. So we're taking the circle for A, we're taking the circle for B, and we're combining them together into one unit. So A union B is gonna be the set that we get if we were to combine these two together and then write whatever is in that set. So what's not going to be included? Well, anything specific to C is not gonna be included because that's not gonna be part of A and B. And then anything outside the circles is also not gonna be included because again, those are elements that aren't contained in A or B. So what we want is all the elements that are specific to A and B. Now here's a shortcut for determining what all is in there. Because there's more things that are in there than are not in there. So you can actually kind of work backwards. We know the universal set contains everything from one to 12. Well, rather than thinking about what is in this particular set, A union B, think in terms of what's not in the set. Because there are fewer things to count that aren't in the set than things that are. Well, the only regions not contained in this union are gonna be right here and right here. And we only have two elements represented there. We have the element four and we have the element eight. So that means A union B is gonna be everything within the universal set 
except for four and eight. Those are gonna be the only things not included. So that's gonna be one through three, skip four, five through seven, skip eight, and then nine through 12. So you can work backwards, particularly when you have the diagram by thinking about maybe instead of what is in a set, what's not in the set. Think about pulling those elements out of the universal set, and that's gonna give you a shortcut for writing whatever set you're interested in. Now let's take a union, but then we wanna take the complement. Now be careful about the order you do things in. Just like when we're looking at the set operations with actual sets and roster method, we have to go in a particular order here. So we're gonna take the union first, we need to identify that, and then we're gonna take the complement of that union. So B union C, that's going to take the set B, the set C, and we're joining them together, thinking of them as one unit. So that's B union C. Now we're not done though, because now we want to take the complement. So that big set that we just got from joining those two circles together, we're now taking its complement, which means we're removing it from the diagram. And again, I can simulate that by covering that up. So what I'm looking for are the elements that are left in the diagram once I take the complement of that particular set. So those are gonna be elements that are specific to A, and then also elements that are contained exclusively in the universal set, but not assigned to A, B, or C. So that's gonna be the number three, and then four, and then 11. That's gonna be the resulting set. Now, A intersected with C. It does not say anything about B. So we don't care about whether or not we're we have something in B or whether we have something outside of B. We're just looking at the relationship between A and C. We're just looking at the A circle and we're looking at the C circle. So we're looking at the intersection for those two circles. So the intersection for those two circles is gonna contain five, six, and seven. Now notice five and seven, those are common to all three sets. Six is specific to just A and C. But again, we're not differentiating between the two at this moment. We're just looking at A and C exclusively. Don't worry about the fact that B is or is not there. So the intersection is going to be five, six, and seven. Okay, C complement. Take C, take the circle for C, remove it from the diagram. So there you go, take C, remove it from the diagram. What's left? Well, we have one, two, three, four, 10, 11, and 12. So one, two, three, four, 10, 11, 12. Now, all three sets, A, union B, union C. We looked at one like this when we were looking at the actual sets and roster method. This means join all the sets together. So join A and B together, and then join it together with C. So we're joining A and B together, and then we're also joining that with C. So this represents all three circles taken together as one big set, one big unit. Now again, rather than thinking of what is in the set, because most everything is in this new big set that we've created, it may help to think backwards in terms of what is not in this set. Because in terms of the regions in the diagram, this is pretty much everything except for one region. What's not represented here? Well, the only thing not represented here is gonna be the region that's associated with the universal set, but has elements that weren't further grouped into one of our circles. So the only element that's not in this particular union is gonna be the element four, since that one was not assigned to A, B, or C. So if we wanna think about the union of A, B, and C, you can think of it as the universal set, all of the elements that are anywhere in the diagram, except for the element four, because that one is gonna be outside of A, B, and C. So A union, B union, C, all of the numbers except for four. Now, if we take A union, B union, C, and then take its complement, Remember, that means we're taking that particular set, we're pulling it out of the diagram, we're removing those elements from the universal set. So visually, that essentially just means get rid of all of the circles. We're deleting any contents that were part of one of the circles. All that leaves us with is then the region that's outside of the circles, which contains the element four. 
Now, once we have this union written, we could also use the complement just based on roster method. If we know what the universal set is, and we know what this particular set is, we just found it, you can imagine taking these elements and then removing them from the universal set. The only thing left over at that point is gonna be the element four, which was outside of those circles. So we can unite all the sets together. We can also intersect all of the sets. So A intersected with B intersected with C means we're intersecting A, B, and C all at one time. We're looking for the elements that all three of them have in common. This is usually the easiest thing, the easiest region to spot in your diagram. In this case, when the diagrams are shaded, this is gonna be the most darkly shaded region. So A intersected with B, intersected with C, Here's A intersected with B, that's A intersected with B. And then if we also add in C and intersect that, that's gonna restrict us to this region here in the middle, region five. So those are gonna be the elements five and seven. And then again, if we wanna take the complement, A intersected with B intersected with C complement, that's saying take the identified region, region five, take that set and then remove it from your diagram and determine what's left. And again, if we wanna work backwards, think about what's being removed. We have the universal set, but now we're removing five and seven. That's what we're pulling out. So everything except five and seven is gonna be left over. So one through four, six, skip seven, and then eight through 12. So you can see how using your fingers covering things up can be beneficial, especially if you consider yourself to be a visual person, a hands-on person. This is a chance for you to get hands-on and really be able to visualize what's happening when you look at these set operations. So now I want to look at an actual applied diagram. This example will sort of help us segue into the next section. The next section we look at is going to be purely application. We're gonna talk about why we define sets, how we use sets, and how a Venn diagram can be used to analyze relationships among sets a little bit better, especially when we're in a real world context. So here's a context we might have. Here's an example of how we might use sets, how we might use a Venn diagram to represent something meaningful. So let's think about what this set, what this Venn diagram or set of sets, this group of sets, what does this actually represent? Because we haven't been told what this represents. But from this particular diagram, we want to be able to analyze what we're seeing and answer some questions. So here's our diagram. We can determine what this represents by thinking about how the sets are labeled. What do the set labels mean? So one set is labeled as exam one, greater than or equal to 90%. We have exam two, greater than or equal to 90%. And then we have exam three, greater than or equal to 90%. So it's reasonable to assume that when we look at this diagram, it's representing grades, it's representing test grades. Anyone who falls into one of these circles made an A on the particular associated test. So anyone who falls into this first circle made at least a 90 on exam one, and then exam two, and then exam three. And then because we're thinking about the entire class, the entire set of students being grouped further into these categories, we also have to think about what the universal set represents. So the universal set represents the entire class, everyone who took a test. Anyone who made an A on a test has been grouped into one of these circles. Anyone who didn't make an A is still in the universal set because they're still in the class, but they didn't make it into one of the circles in the diagram. So let's answer some questions based on what we now know about how this diagram is structured and what it represents. First thing we want to identify is the set of students who scored 90% or above on exam three. Now we don't care how they did on exam one, how they did on exam two, we're just interested in how did they do on exam three. So we're looking at the circle representative of exam three. Anyone that's anywhere within that circle made at least a 90 on exam three. So we have Lee and Maria, we have Jose, and then we have Ron and Grace. And notice Jose, Ron, and Grace also did well on at least one other test. We're not interested in that though based on what's being described. All we care about is who has made it into the circle for exam three, and those are gonna be the students that qualify there. 
What about the set of students who scored 90% or above on exam one and exam three? So we're looking at exam one and exam three, both of them. So we're looking at the intersection between those two sets. Now, technically that defines two separate regions, but notice one of those regions is empty. This particular region that represents students who only scored well on exam one and exam three, that's actually empty. The only student listed scored well on all three of them. So the only student that would make it into this set is going to be Jose. Okay, the set of students who scored 90% or above on exam one and not on exam two. So they did well on exam one and not on exam two. Not means get rid of that circle, so not exam two. So they did well on exam one, they made it into that circle, but they didn't do well on exam two. Well, that's gonna leave Lily and Emma in this case. The set of students who scored 90% or above on exam two or exam three. So we're going to include them if they did well on exam two. We're gonna include them if they did well on exam three. We're gonna include them if they did well on both of them. We can think of that as being the union. In this case, it's the union of the circle for exam two and the circle for exam three. So think of taking those two and joining them together. The only thing we're excluding at that point is what would be in the circle for exam one exclusively. So all of the students listed within that combined United region, those are gonna be the students that fall under that category. Okay, next one. The set of students who scored 90% or above on exactly one test. So it doesn't give us a particular test, but we want the ones who only did well on one test. What does that look like? Well, that's gonna be students who fell into one circle exclusively. In terms of visualizing what this represents, what this looks like, it's going to be the regions of the circles that don't represent overlap. So the regions of each of these three circles that don't represent overlap. Anyone who was recorded in one of those regions only did well on the exam associated with that particular circle. So that's going to be these three regions, the ones in the circles that aren't shaded because they don't represent any overlap. Okay, the set of students who scored 90% or above on at least two tests. So maybe they did well on two or they could have done well on three. At least means at minimum. So where would we find the students who did well on exactly two tests? Well, those would be the intersecting regions, but the ones that don't represent the innermost intersection where all three circles are overlapping. So the students who scored well on exactly two would be Anne, and then Ron and Grace, and then notice that no one scored exactly or scored well on exactly two tests if we're looking at exam one and exam three. No one falls into that category. So exactly two is the lighter shaded regions. And then all three, the, there's only one student who scored well on all three tests, and that's gonna be Jose. So anyone that's anywhere in an, inter, in an overlap scored well on at least two tests. Okay, and then the last one, the set of students who scored 90% or above on exam one and not on exam two or exam three. Well, what does this actually mean? Let's think about how this would be visualized. Let's think about the exam two or the exam three part first. What does it mean to say exam two or exam three? Well, that means if they fell into exam two, they're included. If they fell into exam three, they're included. If they happen to fall into both, they're also going to be included. So just exam two or exam three is gonna be this region. It's going to be the union between those two circles. That would be the region representing exam two or exam three. But here's the rest of it. They did well on exam one and not on exam two or exam three. When you see the word not, not represents the complement. So we're saying take the complement of the set represented as exam two or exam three, which in this case means the union of those two circles. So if I'm saying not exam two or exam three, 
what I'm doing is taking the union and then I'm omitting the union. I'm removing it. I'm taking the complement. And so students who did well on exam one fall into the circle for exam one, but if they didn't do well on exam two or exam three, that means we're no longer considering, considering students that would fall into either of those circles. So that's just going to be Lily and Emma in this case. So those are the only questions we were asked, but you can think about other kinds of things you might look for. You might be asked, give me the roster for the class. That's another way of saying list what's in the universal set. Anyone that falls anywhere in this diagram is a student in the class. So anyone who's been grouped into a circle did well on a certain test. Anyone who's outside the circle, we don't necessarily say that these students did poorly. That doesn't necessarily mean that these students are failing. It just means maybe they made a B on every test, which isn't necessarily bad. So we don't want to over, we don't want to over generalize what we're looking at. We really have to think about the context of the problem. So we could be asked for other things as well. We could ask, be asked for students who didn't score at least a 90 on all tests. Well, that would be the students outside of those circles. There are other things we can determine from this particular diagram. So with this diagram, we had actual names, actual specific elements listed. What we're going to look at in the next section is essentially the same kind of thing, but rather than thinking about exact set contents, we're going to think more about the number of elements in a set. How many people fell into a specific region? How many people fell out of a specific region? However, the skills we have here, identifying our set operations, identifying the sets we're looking at, do they fall into a circle? Do they fall out of a circle? All of those skills, we're also going to use those.